Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Claudia Rankin. Good evening. It's such a pleasure to be here. I cannot communicate this. Um, many, many years ago in my 20s, I had the difficult decision to make. Should I go to law school or should I become a poet? <laughs> so I was, I was um, working as a paralegal in a law firm downtown. And you know what I did in the evenings? I came to the 92nd Street Y and took a writing course. So this has always been a destination for me. I want to thank um, all of the students who shared their stories and listened to the sharing of stories this afternoon. It was a real honor to be able to listen to your work. So thank you, all of you. And of course, I want to thank Barnard and Cleone and Sarah for inviting me here today and, um, and all of you for coming. Citizen, um, on the cover of Citizen is the hoodie done by um, David Hammonds in 1993, a year after the beating of Rodney King. And um, a lot of people believe that he did it in reference to Trayvon Martin. But the dynamics of Trayvon Martin's death is a dynamic that uh, we have had to live with for centuries. So he could have done it tomorrow or yesterday or 100 years ago, but he did it in 1993. And if you don't know his work, he also um, did things like selling snowballs on 125th Street. Um, so that you can feel whiteness melt in your hands. <laughs> and because he was influenced, because Hammonds was influenced by Duchamp, he's very interested in ready-mades, uh, objects inside black culture that begin to mean more than the thing itself. And so you can also find pieces like the bejeweled chandelier of the basketball hoop. That's Hammond's there in a piece called Concerto in Black and Blue, which is um, referenced in Citizen. Could you talk louder? Yes, I will. <laughs> OK. All right, so the first, I'm going to read the first piece in Citizen. When you're alone and too tired even to turn on any of your devices, you let yourself linger in a past stacked among your pillows. Usually you are nestled under blankets and the house is empty. Sometimes the moon is missing. And beyond the windows, the low gray ceiling seems approachable. Its dark light dims in degrees, depending on the density of clouds, and you fall back into that which gets reconstructed as metaphor. The root is often associative. You smell good. You were 12, attending St. Philip and James School on White Plains Road, and the girl sitting in the seat behind asks you to lean to the right during exams so she can copy what you have written. Sister Evelyn is in the habit of taping the hundreds and the failing grades to the coat closet doors. The girl is Catholic with waist-lent brown hair. You can't remember her name. Mary, Catherine. You never really speak except for the time she makes her request and later when she tells you you smell good and have features more like a white person. You assume she thinks she is thanking you, 
for letting her cheat and feels better cheating from an almost white person. Sister Evelyn never figures out your arrangement, perhaps because you never turn around to copy Mary Catherine's answers. Sister Evelyn must think, these two girls think a lot alike. <laughs> or she cares less about cheating and more about humiliation, or she never actually saw you sitting there. So that piece is followed in Citizen by this photograph by Michael David Murphy. And when I saw this work, I asked Michael if he photoshopped the street sign. And he said, no, you can go there. It's, um, you can go there and buy a house on that street in Flowery Branch, Georgia. And I was attracted to the photograph for a number of reasons. One of them is the positioning of that stop sign. So it enacts its own segregation. And so I said to Michael, um, did you ask the people why they named a street Jim Crow Road? And he said he did. And they told him that the street was named after James Crow. And he asked them, well, why didn't you call the street James Crow? And they said, well, because we call him Jim. <laughs> so, so there you have it. And what I love about the photograph is it brings a literal representation to a dynamic that's true not only in Georgia, but all over this country. The redlining that has occurred that allows for segregation in terms of the communities we live in, the um, ways in which we self-segregate our friends, who we marry, who we um, choose to tell our secrets, who we choose to pass our time with, who shows up at our dinner table. These are all choices being made and some of them institutional, some of them legislated against, but they're part of our history, part of our day-to-day -day lives. And so I, 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 was, I was actually quite happy to find this literalization of, um, if that's a word, of our um, practices as Americans. Citizen begins with a series of um, stories, prose poems, that came from calling up friends and saying to them, can you tell me a story where you were interacting with a friend, a colleague, or doing some ordinary thing, and suddenly you were reduced to your race? Or another way of thinking about it, suddenly racism entered and derailed the encounter, the interaction. So I'm going to read you um, one or two of those. Because of your elite status from a year's worth of travel, you have already settled into your window seat on United Airlines when the girl and her mother arrive at your row. The girl, looking over at you, tells her mother, these are our seats, but this is not what I expected. The mother's response is barely audible. I see, she says. I'll sit in the middle. That was a long flight for me. Um, you know, I, a friend of mine said, well, you know, my daughter never, she doesn't want to sit next to strangers. I'm like, it wasn't about the child. It was the mother's response, teaching her how to react. The new therapist specializes in trauma counseling. You have only ever spoken on the phone. Her house has a side gate that leads to a back entrance she uses for patients. 
You walk down a path bordered on both sides with deer grass and rosemary to the gate, which turns out to be locked. At the front door, the bell is a small round disc that you press firmly. When the door finally opens, the woman standing there yells at the top of her lungs, get away from my house, what are you doing in my yard? It's as if a wounded Doberman Pinscher or a German Shepherd has gained the power of speech. And though you back up a few steps, you manage to tell her you have an appointment. You have an appointment, she spits back. Then she pauses, everything pauses. Oh, she says, followed by, oh yes, that's right, I'm sorry, I am so, so sorry. That, that was told to me by a professor in Northern California who's a good friend of mine. And I said to her, what happened next? And she said, well, I went to the appointment. <laughs> and I know we gasped, but I think I might have gone to the appointment too, because I think we go through life kind of doing the next thing, right? And assimilating these moments and putting them away until later. And so later, she went home, she said, and burst into tears, at which point she wrote a letter to the therapist and told her that she would not be coming back. That piece is followed by this piece, the piece on the right, my right. Um, it's a sculpture done by the artist Kate Clark. She um, buys hides and then, she, like a taxidermist, she stuffs them and then she casts face and those get stapled or stitched on. And I wanted the piece to follow the piece I just read, partly because I was thinking about if the woman is a wounded Doberman Pinscher, then what is my friend? And I thought, oh, she is an animal that gets hunted. She's an animal that is being taught how to be fearful around other people, around people. And, um, and I thought, dear, that's, that's the closest I would get to that. So I... Um, I contacted Kate and I asked her if I could um, have the rights to replicate this image in the book. And, and she said, well, can I read the book and maybe I could, you know, commission a piece and we could do something specific for the book. So I did, I commissioned a piece and she did the piece on, on my left. And when she showed it to me, as beautiful as it is, I wasn't interested in it, partly because what I, was drawn to in the original piece was the look on the face, the, the sort of effective position, positioning of the eyes that seemed to have a question in them. Um, because I feel like that is sort of my positioning, <laughs> that one is always questioning how it is that human beings have to fight for the right to be human beings. Again and again, and in friendships even, or at work, or getting a bagel, or playing tennis. So in the middle of this book is a piece um, on Serena Williams, and I, I thought I would read you a little bit of that. What does a victorious or defeated black woman's body in a historically white space look like? Serena and her big sister, Venus Williams, brought to mind Zora Neale Hurston's I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. This appropriated line stenciled on canvas by Glenn Ligon, who used plastic letter stencils, smudging oil sticks, and graphite to transform the words into abstractions, seemed to be ad copy for some aspect of life for all black bodies. Hurston's statement has been played out on the big screen by Serena and Venus. They win sometimes, they lose sometimes, they've been injured, they've been happy, they've been sad, ignored, booed mightily, see Indian Wells. 
they've been cheered, and through it all and evident to all were those people who were enraged that they were there at all, graphite against a sharp white background. For years, you attribute to Serena a kind of resilience appropriate only for those who exist in celluloid. Neither her father, nor her mother, nor her sister, nor Jehovah her God, nor Nike Camp could shield her ultimately from people who felt her black body didn't belong on their court, in their world. From the start, many made it clear Serena would have done better struggling to survive in the two-dimensionality of a millet painting rather than on their tennis court, better to put all that strength to work in their fantasy of her working the land rather than be caught up in the turbulence of our ancient dramas, like a ship fighting a storm in a Turner seascape. That essay, lyric essay, that's at the center of the book, includes, these are other um, examples of Kate Clark's work. I, I'm especially fond of the, the one on the left. Um, inside Serena's essay um, are these images, or the image on my right of Nick Cave's. Um, Nick Cave is, um, he was trained as an Alvin Ailey dancer, and then he began making these sound suits. And I was really interested in how and why he began making them. And I did a little research and I came across this little narrative, it's very short, I'm gonna read it to you, um, that, he, that he wrote. He says, I was thinking about, well, you know, I'm a black male. I know what it's like to feel discarded, dismissed, devalued. You know, the moment I leave my house, I could be a victim of circumstances you just never know. I looked down and saw a twig, something that I walk on, something that I dismiss, and I, it just sort of clicked. He was meditating on the media portrayal of, of um, Rodney King, and he thought of him as larger than life, 10 men to bring him down. What does that look like in my head? It ended up looking like a suit made of twigs. I drilled holes in the delicate tree parts to create a massive object, but I didn't even think I could put it on my body. And then once I stepped into it, I thought about building this sort of second skin, you know, a suit of armor, something for protection purposes. Then I started thinking about protests. In order to be heard, you've got to be aggressive, you've got to speak louder, you have got to make sound. Hence, the name Sound Suits. So that's how those came to be. I'm gonna read um, two more pieces. I'm skipping a lot, obviously. My brothers are notorious. They have not been to prison. They have been imprisoned. The prison is not a place you enter. It is no place. My brothers are notorious. They do regular things like wait. On my birthday, they say my name. They will never forget that we are named. What is that memory? The days of our childhood together were steep steps into a collapsing mind. It looked like we rescued ourselves, were rescued, and there are these days each day of our adult lives. They will never forget our way through these brothers, each brother, my brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart. Your hearts are broken. This is not a secret, though there are secrets, and as yet I do not understand how my own sorrow has turned into my brother's hearts. 
the hearts of my brothers are broken. If I knew another way to be, I would call up a brother, I would hear myself saying, my brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart. On the tip of a tongue, one note following another is another path, another dawn, where the pink sky is the bloodshot of struck, of sleepless, of sorry, of senseless. Shush. Those years of and before me and my brothers, the years of passage, plantation, migration, of Jim Crow segregation, of poverty, inner cities, profiling, of one in three, two jobs, boy, hey boy, each a felony, accumulate into the hours inside our lives where we are all caught hanging, the rope inside us, the tree inside us, its roots, our limbs, a throat sliced through, and when we open our mouth to speak, blossoms, oh blossoms, no place coming out. Brother, dear brother, that kind of blue. The sky is a silence of brothers all the days leading up to my call. If I called, I'd say goodbye before I broke the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't hang up. My brother hangs up, though he's there. I keep talking, the talk keeps him there. The sky is blue, kind of blue. The day is hot. Is it cold? Are you cold? It does get cool. Is it cool? Are you cool? My brother is completed by sky. The sky is a silence. Eventually, he says, it is raining, it is raining down. It was raining, it stopped raining. It is raining down. He won't hang up. He's there, he's there, but he's hung up, though he's there. Goodbye, I say. I break the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't hang up. Wait with me. Wait with me, though the waiting might be the call of goodbyes. So that piece is followed by the lynching of Tom Schiff and Abram Smith, the photograph um, that was taken August 7, 1930 in Marion, Indiana. It was the most difficult image to get for the book. Um, when I um, asked um, for the rights, I was told that I couldn't have them. And um, I talked them into reading the text and um, they said they would consider it if I sent them the tax. Initially, I, I was confused as to why I couldn't have the rights, and they said, you can't have the rights because Holton Archives is afraid that people will use the photograph to support what's in the photograph. And, um, but then I realized, oh wow, I'm not a white supremacist. So, so I had a chance. So I, I did buy, I did buy, was able to um, purchase the rights to use it, and then I called them up and asked them if I could remove the bodies, and they said yes to that. There's, there, there's an artist um, who also, I think since 2004, has done um, erased lynching bodies in the West. I, I, Somebody brought his work to my attention recently, so obviously other people have had that idea. So I will end with this piece. I, um, I live in Southern California, and I hike whenever I can. It's my favorite form of standing up and being outside. <laughs> walking with my one foot in front of the other up a mountain. I, it seems an appropriate way to pass my time. So I, I walk with my friend Jen, and, and she's a white woman, and I said to Jen one day, can you tell me something you do because you're white? And she said, um, she told me a couple things, and I was like, uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't think so. But, um, but then on our way down the mountain, she said, well, there is one thing I do, but I don't do it here in California. I do it in New York. And I said, what is that? And she said, well, if I'm on public transportation and the seat next to the black man is empty, I will sit in it. And I thought, well, I do that too. <laughs> so does that make me, uh, you know, I'm not even going to go down that road. And then. Um, <laughs> 
But we then ended up having a really interesting, at least interesting to me, conversation about the ways in which we address the injuries that our society imposes on other people in the society. And that sitting in that chair has become a small way to recognize why that chair is empty. On the train, the woman standing makes you understand there are no seats available. And in fact, there is one. Is the woman getting off at the next stop? No. She would rather stand all the way to Union Station. The space next to the man is the pause in a conversation you are suddenly rushing to fill. You step quickly over the woman's fear, a fear she shares, you let her have it. The man doesn't acknowledge you as you sit down because the man knows more about the unoccupied seat than you do. For him, you imagine, it is more like breath than wonder. He has had to think about it so much, you wouldn't call it thought. When another passenger leaves his seat and the standing woman sits, you glance over at the man. He's gazing out the window into what looks like darkness. You sit next to the man on the train, bus, in the plane, waiting room, anywhere. He could be forsaken. You put your body there in proximity to, adjacent to, alongside, within. You don't speak unless you are spoken to, and your body speaks to the space you fill, and you keep trying to fill it, except the space belongs to the body of the man next to you not to you. Where he goes, the space follows him. If the man left his seat before Union Station, you would simply be a pe person in a seat on the train. You would cease to struggle against the unoccupied seat. When, where, why, the space won't lose its meaning. You imagine if the man spoke to you, he would say, it's OK, I'm OK, you don't need to sit here. You don't need to sit, and you sit and look past him into the darkness. The train is moving through a tunnel. All the while, the darkness allows you to look at him. Does he feel you looking at him? You suspect so. What does suspicion mean? What does suspicion do? The soft gray green of your cotton coat touches the sleeve of him. You are shoulder to shoulder, though standing. You could feel shadowed. You sit to repair whom, who. You erase that thought. And it might be too late for that. It might forever be too late or too early. The train moves too fast for your eyes to adjust to anything beyond the man, the window, the tile tunnel, its slick darkness. Occasionally, a white light flickers by like a displaced sound. From across the aisle, tracks, room, harbor, world, a woman asked a man in the rows ahead if he would mind switching seats. She wishes to sit with her daughter or son. You hear, but you don't hear, you can't see. It's then the man next to you turns to you. And as if from inside your own head, you agree that if anyone asks you to move, you'll tell them we are traveling as a family. Thank you very much.